we were on our way to a restaurant, and we were with a brand new couple. It's, it's one of those couple dates, and the restaurant was about 40 minutes away, and we were riding in the car, and we were having a great time. And then his phone rang, and he looked at it, and he said, oh, I missed a call from my mom. And boy, did that change the whole course of the evening. What had been a very pleasant conversation began a litany of his wife telling him how horrible his mother was. And Brooke and I are in the back seat, and we just looked at each other. And Brooke gets really nervous, and I got, like, really excited. Like, oh, we just, we just got some entertainment with dinner. It's going to be, it's gonna be a, a great night. And Brooke's just, like, looking at me, and we're holding hands. And she's, we were newlyweds at the time, and now... Now we hold hands, I'm like, okay, it's a little sweaty, we're good, you know, but we were, we were newlyweds at the time where we still like to hold hands. I, I love her, I mean, don't get me wrong, I still love her very much, but I'm just like, we, you know, I'll put an arm around you or something, the hand, no, I'm just a little sweat, no good. Anyways, we were holding hands, and she just like starts putting the death grip on my hand because she's so uncomfortable, and then that went from how horrible his mom was into how she fails at these things, and when he fails at these things, and I thought I was going to have to do some marriage counseling there in the back seat, but I'm like, well, this is, this is interesting, and by the time we got to the restaurant, they didn't want to talk to each other anymore, and so it was a really long dinner, and then we went to a movie because you don't have to talk at a movie, but we got home and we're like, I'm probably not going to go out with that couple again. It was just really, really strange dynamic. You know, sometimes when you're fighting, it's best to just keep it within the family. It doesn't mean you have to be fake. It doesn't mean that you have to pretend everything's great. But it does mean that you don't want to air your grievances in front of everybody all the time. We're going to be looking at that amongst some other themes this morning as we continue our look at the book of 1 Corinthians. And, and for those of you who are just joining us, we're in the middle of something called correction, and we're so glad that you're here. But we're looking through a letter that an old pastor wrote to his old church that he still loved very much. And his name was Paul. And the church was in a town called Corinth. It was a city, and so hence the name Corinthians. And so we're in 1 Corinthians. If you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on the Bible app. It's a phenomenal app, and we can't recommend you download that enough. And if you don't do the whole technology thing, we would love for you to engage with, with the Bible as well. We believe the best way to get to know the heart of God is to find out how he's revealed himself, and that's through Scripture. And so if you don't really do technology, but you want to learn more about Jesus and you want to know more about God's plan for this world and your life, then just hit us up afterwards and we'd love nothing more than to send you home with the Bible totally free. It's just our gift to you, but, but we want everybody to engage scripture because it is the best way to understand the heart of God. So we've been looking over the first few chapters of Corinthians and today we're, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 6. So follow along with us as we start in verse 1 where we read these words. When one of you has a grievance against another... Does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I want us to just understand some things, and this, is, this has got so much to it. We're just going to look at a couple of the overarching principles and themes today. We don't have time to talk about all the, all, the, all the roles we'll have in eternity and how God will use those who follow him to, to also judge things and, and our standing with angels. We don't have time to dive into all that. Those are things you can study and think about this week. But, but just a couple principles we want to talk about today is, is this, when one of you has a grievance against another, understand what he says here. It's very clear. When, not if, when. We are a collection of people. Every church is a collection of people who are unified around the fact that they love Jesus, which means that there are going to be different political ideologies, which means there are going to be different 
different upbringings and different styles of things and different convictions about things because scripture is crystal clear on some things and we're going to talk about those in a little bit and scripture is not crystal clear on other things and so where scripture is crystal clear you should be crystal clear but where scripture isn't crystal clear well you need to understand the fact that just because you have a conviction about something somebody who loves Jesus just as much or more than you can have another conviction about it and it doesn't make them right and you wrong and it doesn't make you right and them wrong there is diversity. And so when all of this happens, just like in any family, when you, the moment you get married, the moment you get married, you are inviting, you're inviting problems into your life. You just are. And it doesn't mean that the person that you're marrying is a basket case. It doesn't mean that they're worse than you. What it means is the instant you say, I do, what you are inviting is you're inviting yourself to sacrifice. And that's not always fun, and that's not always easy. Marriage is really hard work. It's really difficult, because what it involves is it involves you dying to some of the things that you want to do to elevate somebody else's needs and desires. And then at some point along the way, whether it's an accident or whether it's by plan, sometimes kids show up. And good luck. Good luck. When, so in every church, in every family, whenever there's more than just you, and dare I say, even if it was just you, there's probably going to come a point in your life where you're like, I'm just sick of me. I'm just sick of me. There's going to be grievances in your life. Understand that. We're not always going to get along when one of you has a grievance against another. So what do we do? Understanding that there's going to be trouble and there's going to be grievances, what, it, what does our response need to be? And he says, don't be so quick to run to someone with a different worldview than you. Don't be in such everybody. Don't be, don't be quick to do that. Realize what God has set you up to do. Realize that God has set you up one day to play a judge and understand that you don't have to run off every time there's a grievance and, and be in such a hurry. And so by the end, by verse 4, notice the language. He says, when you have a grievance against one another, but notice verse 4, he says, so if you have such cases. So if you have such cases. You're not going to get along all the time. You're not going to see everything in the same way. But understanding who we are as part of a community, as part of people who come together, who say Jesus is more important and we love Jesus and he is greater than me, not every case has to rise to this level. And so by the end, he says, if you have such cases, if you have such cases, understand our design as a family should help us deal with differences and see that every difference is not a big deal. It just isn't. Nobody's right all the time. So every difference is not a big deal. And then he continues in verse 5 when he says this, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. It's like you should be absolutely ashamed with what you're doing. Where is the wisdom in this? Where is the wisdom in this? You're fighting and then you go and you go to court against each other? You sue each other? Where's the, where's the wisdom of this? He says, no matter the outcome, no matter the outcome of the trial, you're a loser. No matter what happens in the trial, you lose. If it, if it gets to that point, You've lost. It doesn't matter what the judge says. It doesn't matter the judgment. You lose. You lose. And then he says this. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. It's better to be wronged it's better to be wronged and move on than it is to fight this publicly. And that's a really hard pill to swallow when you know you're right. That is a really hard pill to swallow when you know you're right. And for this whole concept to come into play when you know that you are right, and he's saying it doesn't matter. Put it away. 
take this one on the chin and let it go. But there's a sense of justice within us, and it's like, but I'm right. And he says, no, 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 it it doesn't matter. If it gets to that point, you've already lost. And so maybe right now you're harboring feelings in your life where you just want a sense of retribution, and you know you've been wronged. But you want to fight it every step of the way. And there are times and there are circumstances where absolutely you should do that. But what we're talking about here is situations where it's one Christ follower against another Christ follower who are part of the same team. He says, let it go. Just walk away. If it gets to that point, no matter the outcome, you've already lost And this is really hard. This is really hard to accept. There are situations in your life where people will not know the whole story. They'll still craft a narrative about you, but they will not know the whole story. And you sometimes will be faced with the choice. Do I air all the dirty laundry? Do I let everybody know exactly what this person has said and done to me? Or do I let it go and keep it in? And he says here, it's better to be wronged and move on. There will be circumstances in your life where other people think they know the whole story and they don't have a clue. But understand, it doesn't change anything for you to go out and for you to tarnish somebody else's reputation and legacy. This is hard. Because what this means is we have to be willing to be wronged in some circumstances. We have to be willing to have people look at us and shake their heads and know that they don't know the whole story. But as Christ followers, it's what we're called to do. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And here we are. And this is as countercultural as it gets. Or is it? Or is it? I mean, in our culture today, theft is generally frowned upon, as is greed, verbal abuse, fraud. They're widely condemned in our society. Widely condemned. Now, we have a much more tolerant view societal wise of sexual immorality, adultery, homosexuality, drunkenness. And so some would say, well, understand that the Bible's a, when these words were written a couple thousand years ago, there there were different themes in play and and anything in in this passage is a cultural is a cultural rebuke to the city itself in Corinth. And so I just want to ask for those of you who would say, well, this is just a cultural thing. Is is it Is theft and greed and verbal abuse and fraud acceptable under a different set of of cultural norms? That's that's the question we would have to answer. The, The difficulty is this. We don't get to be selective about the list. We don't get to be selective about the list. But on the flip side, we don't get to be selective about the list. Which means we don't get to stand and loudly condemn the struggles of others because we ourselves don't struggle with that issue. And so we don't get to say, well, I don't struggle with that. So look at this person and look at all of, all of what's going on in their life and look at how horrible their life is because it's not something that I personally struggle with. We don't get to be selective about what's on the list. But the list doesn't change. Let me be perfectly clear. Let me be perfectly clear. 
Our primary concern for people is who their Savior is, not who they're sleeping with. Our primary concern for people is who their Savior is, not who they're sleeping with. So that if Jesus isn't your Savior, I could care less who you're sleeping with. Whether you're gay, straight, bisexual, or pansexual, it makes no difference to me whatsoever if Jesus is not your Savior. The question is, More so than your sexual preference. The question is, who is your Savior? We talked last week about the fact that we shouldn't expect people who don't follow Jesus to have their lives look like Jesus. And so we have to be really careful that we understand the starting point of all of this is a relationship with Jesus. This is what it's all about. Notice he continues. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He says this list, this list is who you used to be. This is who you used to be, but it isn't who you are. It doesn't have to be who you are. Who you used to be does not define who you are. Culture says to us, celebrate who you are. But Scripture says, celebrate who God's made you to be. Our culture says, just celebrate whoever you are. But Scripture says, no, 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 no. Celebrate who God's made you to be. Which means there's hope for the adulterer. Which means there's hope for those who have verbally abused other people. Which means there's hope for the idolater. Which means there's hope for thieves. It means there's hope for the greedy. It means there's hope for the drunkards. It means there's hope for the frauds. It means there's hope for those who struggle with homosexuality. It means that there is hope for every single one of us. And that hope is Jesus. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our struggles all look different. But God is greater than our struggles. He is greater than the things that hold us back and hold us down and continue to plague our minds. God is greater than our regrets. He is greater than our circumstances. And His love conquers all. Because his love on full display was his son Jesus coming to pay the price for my mistakes and my choices and my sins and for yours. Because the cost of those things, the Bible tells us, is death. That's a physical death which we will all experience, but it's also a spiritual death, which means we are separated from our creator. We're separated from God. That's why for those of us who made the decision to follow Jesus, we can point back to circumstances in our lives, especially for people who made the decision to follow Jesus later on in their life, and they can point back and they can, they can just describe for you an incredible change that has taken place in their life. And the reason for that is because they discovered what it's like to have intimacy with their creator, where once there was never intimacy, and there was always a peace that was missing. And if you follow Jesus, and yet you aren't really following Jesus, you've, you've kind of fallen away, you, you aren't really putting any effort into it, you're not really listening to what Scripture says about the path of your life, then you've experienced some of that as well, because you understand that when God takes away some of His favor, and when sin hardens your heart, it feels like you're separated, and it feels like you're distant. 
because you don't have the full intimacy that you have when you're walking with your Creator. But no matter your sin, no matter your struggle, there is hope. And His name is Jesus. He died on a cross, and three days later, he rose again, proving that he was victorious over all of our sins and over all of our struggles. And so let's understand that in a culture that celebrates certain things, we choose to follow Scripture. Culture changes. Scripture doesn't. Is homosexuality a sin? Is practicing homosexuality a sin? We have to look no further than 1 Corinthians 6. But the question is then, well, are people born gay or do they choose to be gay? The answer is both. Both. I'm born with struggles as well. Now, my struggles may be different, but that doesn't mean that my struggles are any worse or any better than anything else. It just means that my struggles are different. The reality is this. Every follower of Jesus has to honor God with every area of their life. Every follower of Jesus has to honor God with every area of their life. And then he says this. All things are lawful for me. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. What? Why? Where does he start talking about a feast in the middle of all this? What in the world is the point of this? Well, first he says, just because I can do something doesn't mean that it's beneficial. But then he introduces food to the discussion because there was a mindset in that day that sex was purely biological. Sex was purely a biological thing. It was like eating. It had, it had meaning. It could bring about pleasure, but it was purely biological. It, it, it wasn't very much difference than food. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, he continues, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. And here is the message. We must all honor God with our sexuality. We must all honor God with our sexuality. For those with same-sex attraction, this means if you're a follower of Jesus, you live a life of celibacy. You live a life of celibacy. For those who are married, if you're a follower of Jesus, what this means is you are to be faithful. You are to be faithful to your spouse. For those who are single, this means you follow God's plan for sexual intimacy. That God's plan is bigger than your desires. That's what this means. That regardless of where you are on the spectrum, we as people who follow Jesus are to honor God with every area of our bodies, including our sexuality. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And here he draws the contrast between honoring God with our sexuality and honoring our own pleasure. He draws the contrast between honoring God with our sexuality and honoring our own pleasure. Listen, it's never just sex. I know that's a prevailing thought and theme of, of the day, that it's, it's just sex. And understand, it's nothing new. That wasn't a new concept 50, 60 years ago in the free love movement. I mean, this has been going on for thousands of years. That's why he drew the parallel of food. It's never just sex. There's always a deeper dynamic. So the call for all of us who follow Jesus 
is to honor God with our sexuality. And then he says this. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You might be wondering, why does this matter so much? Why does sexual sin matter so much before God that we would devote pretty much the end of this chapter of of 1 Corinthians 6? Why does it matter so much? Why does God care about my sexuality? Why? Why does this matter? The reason is because sex is a gift from God that is created and it's one of the most powerful things that he has given to us. And as a result of that, it has the potential to shape your life more so than any other sin. Sexual sin has the potential to shape your life more so than any other sin. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Certainly don't point at anybody, all right? But, But listen, you have a sexual regret? First of all, every one of us could raise our hands about that. There's nobody in this room who's always gotten it right. There's nobody in this room who hasn't fallen, made mistakes, been with somebody they shouldn't have been, fantasized about being with somebody that they shouldn't have been, looked at something that they shouldn't have looked at, done some things outside of marriage that they shouldn't have. You're not alone. You're not alone. How long have you carried that? See, the reason God cares about this so much is because this has the power to shape your life and to be something that you hang on to for the rest of your life. This can mark you and it can shape you more so than any other sin. Like 20 years later, you don't remember the 14th trip you made at the all-you-can-eat crab leg, bu- crab leg buffet and just been an absolute glutton. I mean, if you remember it, you, you laugh about it a little bit and you're like, yeah, I re- remember that night. But, you know, 20 years later, you're not like just overcome with regret about that night. But how many people carry around 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. The regret of a sexual decision. The scars. The hurt. The heartache. The reason God cares about this so much is because he has a plan for your life. He doesn't want you to be enslaved. He doesn't want you to be a captive to hurt and regret and mistakes. He wants you to live a life of freedom. I don't know what your past is. I don't know what your story is. I don't know about the hurt and the regret that you've carried for years. I don't know about where you even find yourself today. But here's what I know. God is greater than your regret. God is greater than your hurt. God is greater than your circumstances. God loves you and his desire is to redeem you from all your mistakes, from all your shortcomings, and from all your sins. And you are never too far gone for God to come and intervene in your story and use it for him and his glory. I don't know what hurt you're carrying, but it's time to let it go. God is bigger. 
And he's already paid the price. So what do we do with all of this? First, understand that you are never too far gone for God to forgive. You are never too far gone for God to forgive. Second, it's better to be wronged and move on than to fight with your family. It's better to be wronged and have people think things about you that are not true than for you to stand up and air all the dirty laundry. Just move on. Third, for those of us who follow Jesus, Worry about who someone's Savior is before you worry about who they're sleeping with. Worry about who someone's Savior is before you worry about who someone's sleeping with. We're trying to reach people with the life-changing hope of Jesus. And once they accept Jesus, then we can talk to them about every area of their life. But it starts with understanding that there is hope and there is forgiveness. Fourth, don't elevate other sins because it's not one you personally struggle with. Don't minimize your own sins and elevate other sins because it's not something that you personally struggle with. And lastly, if you're a follower of Jesus, honor God with every area of your life, including your sexuality. God wants every area of your life, including your sexuality. So what does this leave us with? Well, it leaves us today with a choice. The greatest choice you'll ever have to make is this. Is Jesus your Savior? Have you reached the point where you understand that all of the hurt and all of the heartache and all of the regret that you carry, you can never fill that void? That the, the mistakes that you've made, you cannot work your way out of to reunite you in full intimacy with your Creator? Have you embraced that yet? And if not, then today's the day for you to embrace the fact that there is a God who loves you and has the best desire and plan for your life. And you give it over to Him. Understanding that He came for you, that He died on a cross, and three days later He rose again, proving that He was victorious. And that you could be made new and you could be restored. If you've made that decision, have you given him your regrets? Or are you still carrying them around as if there's something you can do about them? And if so, make today the day where you just say, I'm letting it go. And lastly, Decide right now. Decide right now whether or not you're going to honor God with every area of your life. And that certainly encompasses your sexuality. And so for those who struggle with same-sex attraction, what that means is you're going to have to say, God, if you don't take these desires from me, I'm going to choose to follow your plan, and that's to live a life of celibacy. If you're married, what that means is I'm going to find intimacy with on, only within the confines of this relationship as God designed it. And if you're single, what that means is you just say, God, I'm going to do it your way. I don't always want to do it your way, but I'm going to do it your way. Because it's the best way. In a minute, we're going to take communion, which for those of you who are new to church, what this is, is it's a piece of bread and it's a little cup of juice. And what it is, is it's the symbol where we look back and we remember what Jesus has done for us. 
that for us to have a renewed relationship with our Creator by giving ourselves over to Him, there was a price to be paid because the cost of my mistakes, the cost of my poor choices, the cost of my sin is death. And Jesus paid that price for me. That God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be my sin, so that in Him I could be restored with my Creator. And so if, if you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, then we just invite you, let it pass you by. If, if you're here and there's some things that, that are going on in your life and you're like, you know, I'm not really ready to surrender every area of my life over to Jesus, but I'm a follower of Jesus, we'd probably invite you just to keep pondering that and probably not take this. But if you're ready to say, God, I want to follow you in every area of my life, in the quietness of this moment, we just ask you to search your heart, search your soul. And if there's anything that you need to confess, that you confess it to God. If there's anything you need to let go, hurt, regret, mistakes that you're carrying, that you let it go now. And then I'll come back out and I'll lead those of us who are taking it. As we remember the hope and the freedom we can have. Because of our Savior, Jesus. God, thank you for your love for us. I pray we'd be people who get along, and God, when we can't get along, that we let it go. That we aren't quick to tell our story and feel like we have to stand up and defend ourselves. God, I pray that we would seek to follow you, even at times our culture doesn't understand or, or tells us it's pointless or worthless. God, I pray that we'd honor you with every area of our lives. Including our sexuality. God, I pray for the person who's carrying regrets and has been for a really long time. And I pray that let them go. They would understand that your grace covers them. I pray for the person who's struggling. And I pray, God, through all the noise and all the confusion, they would be resolved to do things your way and to follow you. And God, I pray for the person who's here and who needs to enter into a relationship with you, that they would do so, and it would change everything for them. Thank you for our redemption. Thank you for our restoration. In Jesus' name we pray.